So as it talks about, I'm an ethicist, and, and so the real issue is ethics is about our behavior. What is it that we actually do? Uh, not what we intended to do, but what actually impacts the things that we actually do. Uh, and the environment responds to all of that material. Uh, and again, just the planetary thought, we're all in this thing together. We're all downwind, downstream from somebody else. Uh, we also need to understand the sustainability is not just about people. It's about trying to keep, again, uh, healthy ecosystems that we are dependent upon. Okay? Um, human population right now is shifting towards urban environments. Uh, right now, uh, there are more than half the world population in a city. By 2050, we'll have about 6 billion, or about two-thirds of the human population will be living in cities. At the same time, we're moving cities because of sea level rise. It's going to be a very interesting sort of you know, commute in that process. Um, the legacy thinking that we've got to overcome, uh, as Dave was talking about, is the way we generally do expansion, which is the first thing you do is you remove all habitat and biodiversity. Okay? Uh, then you find some like, model that you like, and you just keep planning until you run out of space. And then you leave it to somebody else to come up with roads, food, you know, your preferred transplanted non-existent ecosystem, uh, and, uh, and all the oil that it takes to run these things. So basically, our design process so far has been you take a place that runs on rain and sunshine that supports the local ecosystem, and you remove it, and you replace it with something that needs basically uh, a global resource stream to provide the nutrition, the fuel, everything else that it needs. Okay? So in this process, what we do is we basically create and foster heat islands, increased heat, uh, issues, heat deaths, air pollution, traffic congestion, displaced persons, climate refugees, 150 species lost per day. This is not something that the natural world is creating. This is the response to the cumulative effect of how we have designed, how we have thought, and how we have built. It's our actions made manifest to us. Okay? And so it also is the greenhouse gases. So far this year, we put 12.5 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already. Um, we, uh, you know, we're causing climate change, global warming, sea level rise, um, climate departure in 2046, which is a really scary thought, um, and then increasing risk to our own species while we're doing all these fun things. So that's the legacy. Now, Babcock Ranch didn't do that, okay? Babcock Ranch rethought the whole process of what is it that we have to do, how do you want to provide all these materials? Um, they had a focus on ecology, sustainability, technology, transportation, education, health, wellness, and stewardship, okay? um, which generally is not in a de development plan that you normally hear about. Okay? Um, because, again, we've got to get out of the mindset and, and the habits that we've been doing for the last 50, 60 years and how we're going to expand communities. So Babcock Ranch wanted to uh, go solar. Um, and to do that, they made arrangements with Florida Power and Light. Uh, Babcock Ranch basically donated the land so that the economics work, would work out according to what the economics have to be for Florida to give you permission to put up an uh, energy system. Okay? Um, so right now, they have the largest solar plus storage uh, uh, solar system operating in the U.S. Okay? Uh, they've got... 174.5 megawatt uh, solar system with 330,000 panels on it. Um, they now have built a tower. So if you go down there, you can actually get atop the tower and really see what you know, a solar array looks like, uh, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, and they've got the 10 megawatt battery storage uh, system. Okay. Now, the history of this site is that Babcock Ranch used to be, originally it was Crescent Bee Ranch. Uh, 91,000 acres uh, st operating starting in 1914. It did, as it says, you know, timber, cattle, row crops, sod. Um, and the land deal that happened, 73,000 acres basically went to Babcock Ranch Preserve. Uh, 17, sorry, 18,000 acres is what the development consists of. Yeah. Um, Scary thought, on average, Americans spend 87% of their time indoors and 6% 6 inside vehicles. As it says, we basically have become an indoor subspecies of, of humanity. Okay? Um, and so what did Babcock Ranch do to sort of confront some of these issues? Um, they've created a landscape in which 
it's native vegetation, there's 50 miles of trails, it's greenways. The whole system is designed to get you out and walking as opposed to locked in a vehicle or locked in a, locked in a building. Okay. The landscape is native trees and plants. You are highly restricted to how much turf you can have in your yard. It's about maybe the size of the stage. Everything else has to be native vegetation. Okay? Now, you get to choose where you're going to put your little turfy stage, but, you know, but once you determine that, then the rest of it is back to native vegetation. Yeah. Um, and they're in the process of not destroying habitats, but restoring them uh, and bringing them back into, uh, into function. Um, so they're, and they've even, this one of the really cool ones is that, yeah, they're planning for panthers, okay? Um, and so part of the areas that they have out there uh, has been set and where they've clumped trees together because panthers like to hunt from clumps and then run out to grab you know, whoever happens to be strolling by. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, so, but it's not right in the housing developments. It's out towards the fringe. So it's, you know, it should be relatively safe for everybody. Um, and the housing developments are all on previously impacted land for all practical purposes. Okay? So you know, they didn't take new land or healthy habitat and put everything there. They took the damaged sites, and that's where they put the homes. Okay. Um, they're looking at microclimates. Again, they want people to, to walk, and so they're, you know, they're dealing with tree-lined uh, streets. This one doesn't look terribly tree-lined at the moment. But uh, in, as the development happens in the more settled area, their plan is to plant another 5,400 and some odd trees um, that's already scheduled to go in to create the shade area for people to be walking in. Um, and all the homes are Florida Green Building Coalition uh, homes, and the whole community is, is a green building uh, area. They also have an organic farm uh, and community gardens so that you can eat locally uh, and organically. Okay. Uh, transportation is it's designed for you to walk. You can bike. Um, they're going to have scheduled and on-call autonomous vehicles. Um, and there's absolutely no need for gas, diesel, or ice, the uh, internal combustion engine, in this site. The whole thing is designed so you don't add to air pollution of any kind. Okay? Um, and the, um, if you want to go down and visit, you know, it's off State Road 31 uh, down at the Fort Myers exit. Uh, but the, the autonomous vehicles are up and running, uh, and you can go if you haven't had the opportunity to go really slow in autonomous vehicles, yeah, here it is. Okay, you can go down and <laughs> go down and take that ride. Um, but again, as they were talking about this idea of sort of changing consciousness, change the way we think, especially for children who are going to grow up in here. Imagine what it's like to have this mix of, you know, if you have a school bus, it's an autonomous vehicle. I mean, all your initial travel is going to be in autonomous vehicles. Um, you got local organic food, so you know where your food comes from. The lighting, the street lighting has been designed so it's dark sky compliant, so you can actually see the night sky and the stars. Um, you got diverse habitats and wildlife, you're running on solar power, you got one gigabyte uh, connectivity, you got hiking trails, native landscape, limited turf. You've got a history of place, uh, and um, you've got the philosophy of, of you know, living stewardship. So, again, the change in consciousness, we're going to act and design like everything is connected, which it actually is, or we're going to continue to ignore that factor. Um, because the risk is pretty high, according to the World Economic Forum. When a risk cascades through a complex system, the danger is not of incremental change, but of runaway collapse or an abrupt transition to a new suboptimal status quo. Okay. So what is it that we want to support? The verdant and the barren? I mean, the verdant and the vibrant, or do we want to support what we've been doing? which is the bad stuff. Our, our development model has been take this and turn it into that. Now we got to take these and turn it back into here, OK? Um, and so part of this, as David said, we've got to pull out, as other people said, we have to stop putting carbon dioxide in. We have to pull carbon dioxide out. Uh, we have to start getting more and more people thinking in planetary mechanisms, because that's us. That's all there is. That's our pale blue dot right there. And so the real question is, are we willing to save ourselves from ourselves? Um, and the real key word here is willing. It can be done. We've got the technology to do this. We know all the starting steps. 
but are we willing to make the commitment, um, just as Lee was saying, to actually make the changes and keep with it? And, and that requires some type of, of emotional commitment to do this stuff. Uh, and so you know, that's really what we have to do. We're not going to be able to make, you know, go and have a brand new start, but we can certainly go from where we are and make a brand new ending other than the one that we're currently heading for. And there's really nobody else to do it but us. So thank you very much. <laughs>